and on and on, almost as long as one of my, all right, little sermons. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse number 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my change and defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without fence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Father, again, we thank you this morning that we have your precious word before us. And as we turn to look at this word, we pray you bless us and speak to us and encourage our hearts in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, this morning we want to think about gratitude and thanksgiving. Gratitude and thanksgiving. In this letter of Paul to the church at Philippi, we find the body of the letter in verse number 3. It commences here with a note of praise. And Paul is writing from a full heart. And he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. William Law, in his book, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life, writes these words. Who is the greatest saint in the world? It's not the one who prays the most or fasts the most. It's not even the one who gives the most. It is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God wills, who receives everything as an instant of God's goodness and has a heart that's always ready to praise God for everything. Let's consider the cause of Paul's thanksgiving. This letter to the church of Philippi is one of gratitude and thanksgiving for the work of grace that God has wrought in the lives of these people. It was also a letter of appreciation for their thoughtfulness in sending Epaphroditus with a gift to Paul while he was in a prison cell in the Rome. And Paul's heart is filled now to overflowing as he reviewed in his mind how God had worked in the church at Philippi, leading souls to salvation, <clears throat> then forming a church, and then the development of that church. The believers in Philippi were constantly in Paul's prayers. And they were the source of unfailing joy and satisfaction to him. He may have been a prisoner in the Rome, but this man is rejoicing in his soul and he's still able to say, I thank my God. Friends, it's a steadfast Christian who is able to say in the midst of adverse circumstances, and difficulties. I thank my 
and God. Now the word that's translated thanks here is first used in connection with the feeding of the 4,000. When Jesus Christ took seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks. It's the same word there. And the word is also used. Uh, you remember that occasion when Paul was aboard the ship, tossed in the storm, the waves were boisterous. And here's what we find. Paul received a revelation from the Lord. And then he told the fearful sailors what the Lord had said to him. Fear not, Paul. Thou might be brought before Caesar. You must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God, hath given thee all that them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be, even as it was shown to me. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. In the midst of pagan sailors, Paul gives thanks to God because of the assurance that God had given to him that none would perish, all would be well. And Paul was thankful for the church at Philippi, just as he was thankful for his daily bread. And every time he thought of this little assembly, his heart was filled with joy and praise to God. You see, Paul was not only a great man of prayer, but Paul was a great man of praise. And when he's writing to the churches over and over again, he'll discover this. He gives thanks to God for those who have come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ the Saviour. To the church of Corinth he wrote in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given to you by Jesus Christ. This church was far from being an ideal church. It had all kinds of serious problems. Yet we find the Apostle Paul he is on his knees and he's praising God for the church at Corinth. To the church at Ephesus, he writes, I cease not to give thanks for you, make a mention of you in my prayers. To the church at Colossae, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. And to the church at Philippi, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request with joy. Look at the screen. Paul remembered them personally and collectively as a church and prayerfully and joyfully in a spirit of praise. Now, Paul may be confined to a prison cell. He may be prevented from doing what is dear to his heart, as going out among the people and preaching the gospel of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, pioneering new countries with the gospel, visiting the churches that he has founded in earlier days. But none could stop him from praying and praising God for those who have come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Now surely, friends, here is something we should emulate this morning. Praying for all the saints. Not only for those in this church, but praying for all the saints of God. Every soul who has been saved by sovereign grace, praying that they might develop in the things of God. You see, in verse 7, Paul says to these believers, you're all partakers of my grace. 
In other words, you share the same grace with me. Why, they had something in common. It was an experience of what we were singing about earlier today, the wonderful, wonderful grace of God. As individuals, they've been to Calvary. They've been to the foot of the old rugged cross. They'd received the mercy and the pardoning of God. They've been to an empty tomb and were now serving a risen Savior. They now bowed before the Lamb of God who is glorified in heaven with hearts that are full and they worship him and they praise him because these people shared a common salvation. Sinners saved by the grace of God. That's all we are this morning. Don't get on your high horse and think you are something. You're just a poor old sinner saved by the grace of God. Sharing the new life in Christ. We have all that in common. Serving the same Lord. And sure of the same destiny. Let's join him together in the bonds of a holy fellowship. It was not their church label. It was their new life in Jesus Christ. It was their love for the Lord and their love for each other. Took them into the realm of real blessing. And with joy, Paul remembered these dear souls in the church at Philippi. But he could not pray for everyone with such joy. For his was a ministry at all times that was watered with tears. Paul saw many who spurned the gospel. They come very close to accepting the Savior. But then they were deceived by the lies of the devil. Deceived by the lure of the world. Caught up in the lust of the flesh. And many perished without Christ. It's happening in our own community. And Paul would say, perhaps, you're not sharing in the same grace as I have. For up to this moment, you've spurned the gospel. You've rejected Jesus Christ. You've tried good works. Tried being a good person. You may be listening or watching at home. That's what you think. I'm a good person. I do good works. Friends, there's only one good work. It took place on Calvary's cross. God is the author of good works. And when you trust his son, you have a wonderful salvation. Ask yourself the question this morning. Are you really a cause for thanksgiving? Did the angels rejoice in heaven because you repented of your sin and turned to a saving faith in Jesus Christ? A true Christian is a person who never, ever forgets what God has done for them and whose behavior and activity are rooted in the soil of gratitude and thanksgiving. And all the saved this morning should have hearts filled with praise and worship and gratitude and thanksgiving unto God. Now the work of salvation is threefold. The work that God does for us in redemption. The work that God does for us in sanctification. And the work that God does through us in service. And this work will continue until we see Jesus Christ. Then the work will be fulfilled, completed. And the Bible tells us 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a wonderful day that's going to be. It was a source of great joy to Paul to know that God was still working daily in the lives of the people, the saints in the church of Philippi. On the basis for joyful Christian fellowship is this, to have God working daily in our lives personally, to have God working collectively in his church for which he died. The believer is joy in the heart. You got joy this morning? At least smile at me. Have you got joy this morning? Yes, we have joy this morning because of the work of the cross on our behalf. The prophet Isaiah says this, Isaiah 12, 3, Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. And the saved ones connect with the words of the prophet Isaiah 61, 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful unto my God, for he hath clothed me, listen to it, with the garments of salvation, and he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, with robes we never deserved. We have them this morning, the best dressed people in Chelsea. I heard an amen at the back. And the believer is joy because of his work. She make us joyful just to think afresh what the Lord has done for us. The believer is joy because of his word. Oh, what a blessing to have the word of God in our mother tongue. You see, God speaks to us through his word. We have it. And if we don't hear what God is saying to us, it's because we're not opening the word of God on a daily basis. God speaks to us every day. But sometimes we're not listening. We're deaf to what the Lord is saying to us. Joy because of his work. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich, so free. Joy because of his word. The Lord Jesus said to his disciples, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy may be full. And when God speaks to you from his word, you are blessed. You might come into the meeting feeling heavy, despondent, but if you hear the voice of God, when the joy starts bubbling up again and you leave the place rejoicing. I hope you do that this morning. So don't fall asleep. The believer is joy because of his work. Joy because of his word. Joy because of his way. His way is truth. His way is life, abundant life, eternal life. The psalmist puts it like this, Psalm 16, verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The joy of the Lord. Think about it. Pleasures forevermore. This world thinks it's enjoying itself today. But the pleasures of sin are but for a season. Then judgment comes. But when we're serving the Lord, into his presence and pleasures forevermore. Remember the chorus you used to sing at Sunday school? If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. We have joy because of his presence. We have joy because of his promises. 
He has never broken a promise yet, and he never will. We have joy because of his purpose. What's his purpose? He's gathering a people unto himself out of every nation in this sin-cursed world. I want to remind you that Jesus Christ is building his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And here's his purpose. He's coming again to take his people home to glory. Aren't you glad you're saved this morning? Because if you're saved, he's coming for you personally. Jesus is coming. The dead shall arise. Loved ones shall meet in a joyful surprise. Caught up together to him in the skies. Jesus is coming again. Do you believe that? He's coming. And he's coming soon. The cause of Paul's thanksgiving, his remembrance of the work of grace which the Lord had wrought in the hearts of the people in Philippi, his remembrance of the blessing he had received personally as he ministered to them, his remembrance of the evidence was displayed in their lives. They were now responding to the work of the Holy Spirit in them. Let's move quickly on to the character of Paul's thanksgiving. Characterized by joy and by prayer. See, the Bible tells us here, Paul had these people in his mind. That's good. But he also had them in his heart. And the best way that you and I can remember our brothers and sisters in Christ is to remember them at the throne of grace, to pray for them. And Paul says to the church at Philippi, I have you in my heart. Now, it's one thing to have someone in your mind. It is something totally different to have them in your heart. Because when in your heart, they're pumping away and you're remembering them at all times. And Paul is saying to the church here, I have you in my mind, I pray for you. I have you in my heart, I love you. And in the context of the verses we read this morning, he's saying to the church, I love you all. Big statement, isn't it? To say to any church, I love you all. And as far as Paul was concerned, there were no exceptions. Paul had a big heart, a heart that was filled with the love of Jesus Christ. It was overflowing to all the saints of God. And Christian love was not just something that Paul talked about. Paul practiced Christian love. He loved these saints in the Lord, not just on a Sunday when the meetings were on, And the hymns were being sung, and the word of God was being preached, and the fellowship was good. We had a good day, and everybody's on a high, we hope. But he loved them from the loneliness of his prison cell. And he not only loved them, he longed for them. He wanted to be with them. Verse 8 of chapter 1. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you in the affections of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, he says to the church, And this I pray, that your love may abound, yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. The apostle is praying that the love of the church of Philippi would grow and develop even more. That is their love for the Lord. Develop more. Their love for each other would develop more. Their love for the word of God would develop more. The love for the church universally would develop more. And Paul wanted these believers 
just to be characterized with the love of Jesus Christ. Because that is quality love. Quality love that we can display to others. It was not Paul's love channeled through Christ. It was the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God that was channeled through Paul to others. And the great servant of God, just that's what I want for your church. And the Lord is saying to us this morning, that's what I want for this church. A developing love. That the love of Jesus Christ may flow through the place. Loving me. Loving my word. Loving each other. Loving all the saints. Dynamic love. A developing love. A discerning love. A love that demonstrated the love of Christ for all to see. Now, how is your love life this morning, spiritually speaking? Pause. Think about it. Love knows nothing of petty jealousies, not touchy, not resentful, slow to suspect, but quick to trust, slow to condemn, quick to justify, slow to offend, quick to defend, slow to demand, quick to give, slow to provoke, Quick to insulate, slow to hinder, quick to help, slow to resent, quick to forgive. Is that the kind of Christian love that I have, that you have? Sometimes we fall very short, don't we, of that standard of love. Television quiz host. Asked a contestant on one occasion, tell me some of the blunders and mistakes that your wife has made over the years. You've been married for 40 odd years. Now tell me some of the blunders and mistakes she's made. The man answered like this very quickly. I cannot remember my wife making any mistakes. And the quiz host, he stood back, what? After all those years? You don't remember her making any mistakes. You're bound to remember something that she did wrong. No, I cannot, the man replied. For I love my wife very much. And love keeps no record of wrongdoings. Did you get that? Love keeps no record of wrongdoings. That's the kind of love God has given to us. The slate has been wiped. Our own doings have been removed, forgotten, buried in the sea of his forgetfulness. And that's the kind of love you and I as believers should seek to have. None of us are perfect. Not even the man on the pulpit, far from it. Not one perfect. We all make mistakes. Do the wrong thing. But the love of Christ remembers no wrong doings. The cause of Paul's thanksgiving for the work of grace in their hearts, the character of Paul's thanksgiving, joy, prayer, love for all saints, the content of Paul's thanksgiving. Verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. You see, here were saints. It stood by Paul. He had supported him with their prayers. He was persecuted for the preaching of the gospel. But they prayed for him. And their fellowship had its foundation in the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. The common cause with the gospel <clears throat> never changed. They were actually partners in the gospel of Christ. They said to Paul, Paul, remember this. We are with you in the work of God. And they showed their support in a practical way. And Paul thanked them for their, you have it on the screen here, for their fellowship in the gospel, for their faithfulness in the gospel, for their friendship in the gospel, for their future in the gospel. Verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. You see, God is his agenda, and he's taken closely to it. He would bring this glorious work to a grand finale. From the start to finish, the gospel is a good work. And the goal is glorification. And all who have trusted the Lord as Savior. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, glorification led into the presence of the Master. But there may be some listening this morning, watching at home, on the internet, whatever, you're not saved. You're not saved. You haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've no hope. You'll never be in heaven. But here's the good news. The gospel is still the power of God on the salvation to those who will believe. Will you join us? Be numbered among the saints who one day will be going home to heaven. Amen.